Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here on this Communion Sunday. There's several things that are going to be happening in the near future. First of all, um, Lent starts on Wednesday. And so you're invited to come and be a part of the Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. There is no watch meal, no watch uh, activities otherwise. And um, there is... Um, Advent devotionals at the, at the uh, doors, so if you already have one, that's great. If, if not, pick one up on your way out. We're going to be walking through Lent. I have the posters um, out here in the gym. If you would sign up to say that you're going to be walking along with us. We're walking uh, the paths of Christ, and so we hope that you will not only walk physically, but that you will also be using it as a way of walking along with Christ during Lent. There's different days. Uh, that you can sign up if you would like to do the Christ Walk book itself. It's a devotional book and an accountability group. If you would like to do that, there's um, times that we're going to be offering that. One is Sunday at 1, Wednesday night, and Thursday at noon. So if you'd like to be a part of that group, please sign up. You also notice that Pastor Gary has some uh, activities coming up during Lent on Wednesday nights. He and Becky will be offering a marriage um, kind of workshop type of thing, and it's going to be at his house, uh, at their house, and, um, sorry, their house together. And uh, if you want to sign up, there is a sign-up sheet in the gym. And also, and I said sheet, not, and um, also there is a sign-up sheet for the um, Tuesday night basic life, basic life. Oh, my goodness. So we have somebody that wants to come talk about the Club 56. We have more than just one. We have a group. Hi, my name is Lydia, and I am part of Club 56. I would like to invite all of our older sweethearts to our third annual Valentine's sweet Sweetheart Tea. It will be on Saturday, February 13th from 12 to 2 in the gym. Please RSVP to Miss Amy through the, off, through the church office. Please remember, if you need child care, this is not an event for you. Thank you, and we are looking forward to serving up a great time. Yay. Today, the youth have your subs. If you've already pre-ordered, please pick them up on your way out. The subs and chili, um, if you didn't get a chance to order, there are some extras. Uh, so, so please stop by and pick up your uh, subs and chili so that you can have a super day today. Um, Pastor Gary would like to talk about Boy Scout Sunday. So, this today is, or this week is the 106th anniversary of the founding of the Boy Scouts. And we are privileged to be the sponsor for Troop 178. And we had about, what, 30? 30 Boy Scouts at the first service it was wonderful, and many of their leaders and families, and it was a wonderful thing. Um, we still have Matt Milby here, who's in, in, uh, in his uniform, man in uniform, and, uh, and we have one uh, who should be in Sunday school, but he is in worship with us right now because he has a presentation to make. And I want to ask him to come on up and help me lead us all in the Scout Oath and the Scout Law together. Full of good stuff, the Scout Oath and Scout Law is. Uh, would you stand, and if you were a Scout, put your fingers up. You still do that, the Scouts? You said, okay. Put your fingers up. Here we go. Ready? On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And then, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Um, if there is a young man who exemplifies the oath and the law in our church, it's Zach Losey. I appreciate him. Uh, watched him these last few years just grow into a wonderful young man. And I um, am grateful that he is here 
to say a word or two about his Eagle project, which is almost done. Zach. Hi, my name is Zach Losey, and I just want to give an update to you all on, on my Eagle Scout project. Um, as you can tell, my Eagle Scout project is very close to being completed. All I have left to do now is to put in the plants, which will be done in the spring. Um, I'd also like to say um, thank you to you all that donated to my Eagle Scout project. I'd say a special thanks to Sam Churchill, John Ackerman, and Bob Bailey, who helped me with the planning and the design of my project. Paul Oman, who helped me um, cut the wood for my crosses and assemble my crosses. Scott Monroe, who helped me with um, the landscaping of my project. Joshua Rassi, who helped me um, drill the holes for my crosses and put the crosses in the ground. And Russ Pribble, who helped me with the lighting of my crosses. Again, thank you all who donated and helped, and have a great day. Before we sing, let's, let's pray for our scouts and for the ministry of scouting. Father God, I thank you for Scott Fischel and for all the adult leaders and for all of the scouts from many different churches and some from our church in our troop. We pray, God, that you would continue to grow these young men into the men that you've called them to be. Pray that you would guide them, bless them, build them, and give them great joy in the process. Pray that you would be with uh, the men and women who have taken leadership with scouts. We pray that you would encourage them. And we thank you for the privilege of supporting them. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Um, let's stand and sing, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. One of my favorite invitation hymns.
please read with me the responsive reading from Psalm 130. Jesus' call is to come. Go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus' call is to go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us sing. that are receiving our offering to do so, one aspect of Christ's call upon our lives is the call to give. Each time we receive an offering, we have a chance to practice answering the call. I hear my name, my Lord is calling me. I can hear him calling my name. I hear my name. My Lord is calling me. He calls me by my name. He leads the way. He leads me all the way with joy and happiness every day. I shout, shout, jump, shout, shout. Praise the Lord. I hear him calling my name. Thank you. 
my name. My Lord is calling me. I can hear him calling my name. I hear my name. My Lord is calling me. He calls me by my name. He leads the way. He leads me all the way with joy and happiness every day. Jump, 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 shout. Praise the Lord. I hear him calling my name. When my days are dark and grim, all I do is call on Him. He makes my pathway bright, and He's near to show me the light. Well, He's my friend. He's my friend. May through our giving, Lord, may it be a way of witnessing our faith to you. Use these gifts. Help them to transform the world as they transform our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Take a moment and greet those that are around you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The peace of Christ be with you. We invite you to be in a time of prayer as we remember those that have been in the hospital or recovering at home, those that have uh, lost a loved one for the Hilpert family, we continue to pray for them. And uh, for those that are facing surgery this week, there are several in our congregation. So uh, let's turn to God in a time of prayer. Lord, come, let your spirit fill this place. Be with us, sit next to us, hold us in your arms. Lord, come into our lives. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to be dedicated to you. Help us to be focused on your call. Lord, come fill our world with your spirit. Help our world to be transformed towards peace. Fill it with your love. Help us to see the needs that are around us and to reach out with the hands of Christ. Lord, we lift up to you our prayers because we know that you hear them 
hear our prayers this morning for those that have been in the hospital, others that are recovering at home. Lord, may your healing happen in their lives. Be with those that are facing surgery this week. Watch over them. Guide the hands that care for them. Lord, we lift up to you those that are grieving. Continue to wrap them in your arms. Continue to help them as they face the new day. May your spirit comfort them. Lord, be in those places in our world where there's brokenness. Bring healing. Be in those places in our world where there's conflict. Bring your peace. Lord, we're mindful of how decisions are made affect the many. We ask for wisdom for our world leaders, for our church leaders. Lord, hear our prayers as we lift them up to you. Lord, we also come before you for ourselves. We ask that you hear the prayers for, for us. Forgive us of our sin. Help us to do what is right. Help us to make good choices. For those places where we have failed you, Lord, forgive us. For decisions that we have made that were not loving and kind, Lord, forgive us for times when we didn't step up when we should have. Lord, forgive us. Hear our confession of sin this day. And Lord, now hear us as we pray in one voice the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God knows our prayers. You know, I think we ought to just assign, you know, one batch to say trespasses and another batch to say debts and the other half to say sins and then we get it all covered. No, I'm just kidding. That's awesome. Well, we leave Jonah and we move on to Jesus. Jonah was that half-hearted, reluctant prophet. Jesus was willing to come. Uh, Jesus came as the perfect prophet, the perfect king, the perfect priest, and the perfect sacrifice. For Jesus was God with us. So we are going to spend a good deal of time between now and the end of April looking at Jesus' call, the words of Jesus' call upon our lives. And this is just the first. But I have to admit, Matthew 22, 1 through 14, this parable as Matthew relates it, that Jesus spoke, is a very uncomfortable parable. It'll make you squirm. Makes me squirm. But that's okay, I think. Hear the word of the Lord. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. 
and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look in at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. As uncomfortable as that is, this is the word of the Lord. What do you say? Lord, we thank you for your word and we ask for your spirit, your illuminating spirit to come and shine the light of this word into our hearts so that we might know who we are as your called, your chosen people. Help us, Lord. In your name we ask it. Amen. So over the next four months, we're going to enter into the world of Jesus. Try to enter into that world by maybe mentally pretending that we're one of the disciples. Walking along, hearing these words, hard as they are, and this call and its many facets. For Jesus called people. Called people to come to follow Him, to deny themselves, to work, to tell, to go, to love, to serve, to pray, and a host of other things. And we'll be looking at the many glorious aspects of the call of God in Christ upon our lives. All of them that we can discern in the book of Luke, for that's the gospel we'll be looking at. So why, you ask, did we read today from the Gospel according to Matthew? I have to be honest. This is not one of my favorite parables in the Bible. I chose it to begin this new sermon series on Jesus' call because of its punchline. Many are called, but few are chosen. That saying is found here and only here in Matthew 22:14 in the scriptures can't find it anywhere else it's not in the book of Luke it's not in Mark it's not in John it's here and that phrase is puzzling and i want us to figure out what it means and the parable in front of the phrase is even more pu- puzzling so let's get to work but first say it with me Many are called, few are chosen. Say it. Many are called, few are chosen. So we got a... John Ackerman came up to me after the first service. And John Ackerman said, I, I, can't, I couldn't get it out of my mind, the Minnesota version of that verse. And I, you know, I bit. I took the hook and I... John, what, what is the Minnesota verse? In fact, he said, many are cold, but few are frozen. 
Had you heard that one? I've never heard that before. Yeah, we got to laugh about this scripture because this is a difficult scripture. This is not easy stuff. There's another parable similar to this one in the Gospel of Luke, one that's much more palatable to me anyway. And we'll explore that one in depth in April. It's the more famous and the more enjoyable of the two. And though it also involves invitations to a feast, it is in many other respects very different from this one. I like that one in Luke. <laughs> Luke 14, 12 to 24. I don't much like this one. This one's uncomfortable. Let's look at some of the similarities and the differences between them. First, the setting. Both involve big meals. In Luke, it's a great banquet offered by the master of the feast out of the goodness of the master's heart. Here in Matthew, it's a wedding feast offered by the king in honor of his son's marriage. Both involve a first set of invitees. In both parables, there are those who are invited first. The focus of the parable in Luke is on the excuses those people make when they turn down the invitation to the feast. Now, when I was, oh, maybe 10 or 12 there were a group of nuns that sang and their music actually hit the charts, so to speak. Do you remember the singing nuns who sang Dominique? That was their big hit. Dominique, Nika, Nika, and I don't remember the rest of the words. Remember that song? My favorite of their songs was a song called I Cannot Come, based on, on the parable Jesus tells in Luke about the great banquet. And these nuns, you know, back then, you know, we hadn't had sister act yet, so we didn't know that nuns could have fun. And these nuns had great fun making, making fun of people's excuses. And the chorus was, I cannot come, I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused, I cannot come. Isn't that a great song? I just love that. And the nuns had fun singing it. That's the fun parable in Luke, but ours is not so fun. In this parable, here in Matthew, they don't make excuses at all. Their response is far worse. They paid no attention. To the invitation. I think that's the most heartbreaking response to our God is when people pay no attention. God would much rather have us say no than to not pay attention. And then their response gets worse. They seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Uncomfortable parable. The inviter, the inviter, how do the inviters respond to the excuses and to the refusals? The consequence for those who make excuses and will not come to the feast in Luke is simply they miss out on the great banquet. But in this parable, the angry king sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. This is not comfortable mostly because we instinctively interpret parables as allegories and we think God. Then there are the next invitees. In both parables, the invitation is extended to others who were not originally invited. And all the commentators agree that Jesus is pointing directly to the ruling Jews of his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were not responding to his call and introducing the idea that the call might be extended to those outside of the chosen people, to those outside of Israel. In Luke, after those first called said, I cannot come, the call went out to the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And here in Matthew, 
the servants go out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. Now, that's a comfort to me. Because I know I'm not good, not in and of myself. I know my, the image of God is tarnished in me. So it's a good thing that they go out and invite the bad as well as the good. So the point of both parables so far, because ours and Matthew isn't done yet, the point of both parables so far is that God wants a full house. And I'm not talking poker. God wants to fill his house to the fullest. And if Israel refuses the invitation, God will call others. In Luke, the master of the feast says, compel people to come in so that my house may be full, may be filled. And here in Matthew, the last line of this section of the parable sums it up. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. I can think of all kinds of applications here, can't you? For example, who do we invite? Like the servants in these parables, we're to do our master's bidding and invite everyone we can to feast, to fellowship, to the love and grace of God in Jesus Christ. Even if this means going out into the highways and byways to do it. Even if this means inviting people we don't generally like. Too often we want to be kind of selective about our invitations. Instead, the parable encourages us not to be selective. Instead, we should be more like General William Booth. What great continuously existing organization did he found? Come on. The Salvation Army. General William Booth left the Methodist Church in Great Britain because the Methodist Church wasn't inviting the crippled, the poor, the blind, the lame, the bad and the good, into the fellowship of believers. And without animosity, without animus, he left the Methodist church and had the blessing of some to begin the Salvation Army. It began in the east end of London where the need was greatest. And one of my favorite memorials to General William Booth's work is a poem written by an Illinois poet named Vachel Lindsay. And it begins like this. It's called, General William Booth Enters Heaven. That's the scene. And Lindsay imagines those who follow Booth into heaven. Listen, Booth led boldly with his big bass drum. The saints smiled gravely and they said, He's come. Walking lepers followed rank on rank. Lurching bravos from the ditches dank, drabs from the alleyways, and drug fiends pale, minds still passion ridden, soul powers frail, vermin eaten saints with moldy breath, unwashed legions with the ways of death. And it goes on and on. It's a great poem. But who do we invite? It's one of the applications of this parable. How many do we invite? Like the masters of these two feasts, our goal should be to fill the great banquet table, to fill the master's house, to fill the wedding hall. So the answer is we should invite as many as possible we know from John 14 that the Master's house has many rooms, many mansions. Let's fill them all. Let's fill them all. And to what do we invite people? 
The parables give us analogies for answers. We invite people to feasts. Feasts are times of celebration and fellowship and joy. Heaven's like that. In Luke, it's a great banquet thrown at the pleasure of the Master. The Master just wants fellowship with His servants, with His creatures, with His people. And in, in Matthew, it's a wedding feast. Heaven is like a marriage supper for a bride and a groom. A great celebration, but from other places in Scripture, we learn that we, collectively, we believers in Christ, we are the bride. The Son is Jesus. We are inviting people to a celebration and to a forever relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We've already seen how different these parables are, but what comes next in our parable in Matthew is nothing like the parable from Luke. Here in Matthew, it's like a coda in music or an epilogue in literature. It, it's extra. It comes after everyone has arrived at the wedding feast. There should be nothing but, but music and dancing and feasting going on. Hear it again. Matthew 22, 11 through 14. The most uncomfortable part of this uncomfortable parable. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. What is this about? What is this? If we were to interpret this parable as an allegory instead of a parable... In an allegory, everything has a one-to-one -one correspondence to something. Everything has a meaning. In parables, it's not so precise. There's more like one general idea with multiple applications. But if we turned this parable, especially the coda, the epilogue, into an allegory, we might be tempted to think that someone got thrown out of heaven. Doesn't it sound like that? They're at the wedding feast. They said yes to the invitation. They were there. They just didn't have their wedding garment. Now we got gnashing teeth? No. We see this parable in a much more fluid way than we see allegories. What Jesus is teaching here seems to hinge on one thing. And down through the history of the church, those who've grappled with this have agreed. The last part of this parable hinges on the wedding garment. Or the lack of one. The man without the wedding garment has been invited and came. It was St. Augustine who first suggested the possibility that these garments may have been provided by the host as an act of hospitality. Augustine was writing about 400 years after Jesus, very much closer to Jesus' day than we are. That these wedding garments might be foreshadowed in the Old Testament in Isaiah 61.10 where it talks about a robe of righteousness given to those who follow God. But when the wedding garments were freely given to each invitee, this man had not taken one. When the king came in to look at the guests, he sees the man without a wedding garment. The king is incensed because the man had refused his hospitality, his free gift, which in Mideast culture is 
a serious, serious thing. So he is bound and thrown out into a place of weeping and teeth grinding, and the whole thing is very uncomfortable. For many are called, but few are chosen. Who are the called, and who are the chosen? Many are called. The call is extended to many, even all. For many is used as a synonym for all in ancient Hebrew literature. The call goes out to all. God calls all. But few are chosen. And just who are the chosen? Is this a picky and selective God we're talking about? For Jesus' listeners, it was an obvious reference to they themselves, the people of Israel. The chosen were the people of Israel, for God chose them for the purposes of bringing salvation into the world. For some Christians, the chosen are the saved, the elect. But the full answer to just who the chosen are comes in two parts. Part one, the chosen are those who respond to the invitation to Christ's call. Those who come to the feast saying yes to Christ's invitation is proof of being chosen. Your response affirms God's choice. That's another point from the first part of this parable. Ah, but what about the guy without the wedding garment? In the epilogue of this parable, why isn't he one of the chosen? He came to the feast, didn't he? He had to say yes to the invitation and came, showed up. The problem is he didn't come on the terms of the one who gave the feast. For the second part of the answer to the question, just who are the chosen? The chosen are those who respond to Christ's call on His terms and not their own. Too many of us, and I'm included in this, we want to come to Christ and enjoy all the, the blessings of heavenly banquet, of wedding banquet, we want to enjoy the fellowship and the celebration. We want heaven for sure. But we refuse the wedding garment, the robe of righteousness, and the call to holiness. Now, our goodness doesn't get us to heaven. But a part of salvation is the theological word sanctification, being made holy. And when we receive Christ, we don't pick and choose. We receive salvation. We come to the wedding banquet. But we receive His holiness as well. The wedding garment. If you want to be one of the chosen... Respond to Christ's call on His terms. And now we begin a four-month examination of that call, looking at the words of Jesus. Some are words we're well familiar with. Others are words that are hard, and sometimes we try to ignore them. We're going to examine the call in all of its multifaceted beauty. Who knows what we can do? Who knows what we can be if we respond to Christ's call on Christ's terms? Come, Lord. Help us not just come into the feast, but to receive the garments of righteousness that you've laid out for us. Continue your work of making us your bride, perfect 
beautiful without blemish through the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now listen. Today, you've been invited to the banquet. Huh? This is the banquet. Today, you are invited into the banquet hall of God. The wedding feast. And a way of saying yes is to hear the invitation through the hymn we'll sing and then receive it through this means of grace. It's what John Wesley called it. A means of, <clears throat> of doing in a physical, tangible way what we want to do spiritually in our hearts. Say yes to Jesus' call on His terms. So let's sing the hymn and get our hearts ready for communion. Stand up. Come sinners to the gospel feast. Let every soul the gospel peace be saved from sin in Jesus rest oh taste the goodness of our God and eat his flesh and drink his blood see him set forth before your eyes love make haste to embrace and freely now be saved by grace he who believe his record true shall stop with him and he with you come to the feast be saved a beautiful picture. Jesus waits to take you in. Have a seat. Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves before you. We confess our sins. We bear ourselves in your presence. And we know we don't deserve this means of grace. But we take, we receive this, your body broken and your blood shed for us. We receive you by faith and with much thanksgiving. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it, in remembrance of me, and be thankful. And likewise, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. And so as we drink from the cup, we are forgiven and offered new life in Christ. All are welcome at the table in our church. 
So it doesn't matter if you're a member or a member of some other congregation. If you trust Jesus, please share communion with us unless your home church frowns on that sort of thing. Uh, everyone, if you'll hold on to the bread until everyone's been served, we'll get to receive it together. And gluten-free is offered in this small cup. Yeah. Lord, we are humbled by your great invitation. And as we hold this symbol of your invitation in our hands, we say yes. We come to the banquet. We ask you to clothe us in the garments of righteousness. We ask that you live in us as we eat this bread, which is for us your body, live your life in us and through us. In Christ's name, amen. Let's eat together.
Lord, we're so grateful that you shed your blood for us. And so as we drink from this cup, may we be reminded of the new covenant that you have given to us and the new life that we have as we put on the garment that you have offered. In Christ's name, amen. So this banquet is over, but the heavenly banquet, the banquet in the parable, there is no end to the banquets that are described in Jesus' parables. So what we do now is we live out the effects, we live out the joys of having received once again the glory of God. Our fellowship in Christ through Holy Communion, we live that out now in the world. So with that in mind, please stand and sing. And we'll just say for the last time this cycle, go tell it on the mountain because it's one of the main things we're supposed to be doing. The girls are taking the light out of the sanctuary, so we follow them with the light of Jesus. Goodbye.